That's all sad. Where did you think you drive? Father had clear cleaning. I grew up at 74. That's how I grew up. That's my It's been hard. Well, I went to the Jewish Uh, if I could ask you to take your seats, we are ready to get underway. Um, I have to tell you that Argentina are on the line and uh, they're waiting for us to get seated here. So um, if you could do that, that would be great. Uh -huh. Okay, okay. Um, Stephen, but they don't understand English. <laughs> Is somebody here that speaks Russian? <laughs> okay. Um, if you would like simultaneous translation into Russian, Please pick up a headphone from the back. Imrotsim Tirgum mi Adil Rusit. If Shalakabel Oznia Mitsarasheni. Здравствуйте, добрый вечер. Для говорящих по-русски наушники нужно взять сзади, вот есть киоск. Они омартили Мишу Довер Русидши и в Шарляках от этого знает. Окей. Other than the few stragglers, I think we're ready to get on the way. Uh, I've made a simcha in Israel before, and I know that you have to start talking for about two or three minutes, uh, and then eventually everybody settles down, and uh, you just fill, fill the time with a few words, and then eventually you kick into something sensible. Uh, so I'll continue to do that for a few more moments, and then uh, you'll all be with me, and we can get seriously started. Um, what I should tell you, uh, this is almost serious now. Um, one of the reasons for moving you along here is because we are doing a live uh, web broadcast uh, to Buenos Aires uh, in Argentina. Uh, many thanks to Marcelo Dorfsman uh, for setting that up. And uh, uh, be, be careful because this session is being record recorded and will be rebroadcast uh, on the internet. The Major League Baseball obviously possess the rights to the broadcast. And um, the broadcast will be trans there will su subtitles will be provided uh, in uh, Russian and Spanish for future broadcast to the graduates of Mahan Khim uh, from the Melton Center who are uh, all over the world. Okay, um, nobody really knows, but it's reasonable to say that there are today about 330,000 Jewish children enrolled in all day Jewish schools worldwide. That's about 225,000 in North America and another 110,000 scattered across the globe in places as diverse as Minsk, Marseille, Melbourne, and Montevideo. While over the last few decades there's been a steady accumulation of research into day school education, until now this research has focused almost exclusively on the nexus between teachers and learners. 
This focus on teaching and learning is entirely reasonable, but it may not do justice to what is at stake in day school education. And I will take a few moments to briefly explain why I say that. For most of the last 200 years, the primary function of schools was to ready children as productive workers in a post-agricultural industrialized society. But today's, today, schools are asked to do much more. They are called on to take on roles once performed by families, religious institutions, and workplaces, and are asked, for example, to instruct children in how to drink sensibly, drive safely, eat healthily, vote conscientiously, and have sex responsibly. I had to get the adverbs in the right order there, otherwise it may have been <laughs> dangerous. Um, Jewish schools have not been free from this spreading burden of responsibility. If Jewish children were once expected to acquire knowledge of Judaism, develop attitudes about the Jewish world, and learn Jewish behavior from people and places in their immediate surroundings, in the family, at the synagogue, even on the street, today, responsibility for these outcomes has been increasingly devolved to schools. To mix metaphors, today, Jewish day schools have become both the surrogates and seedbeds of community. They have taken on social functions that were unimaginable 50 years ago, but which today have been passed on to them by other community institutions. And it is this changed concept, context that has provoked us to create this conference and to conceive of its goal as one of reframing Jewish day school education worldwide. When we talk of reframing, we essentially mean three things. First, we want to focus not just on the learner, but on other clients and stakeholders in day schools. We think it is important to see schools as agents of and for the community. And encouragingly, this is what you will find is done in more than 40 papers being presented over the next two days. Second, given the growth of day school education worldwide, we want, to truly, we want to bring a truly international perspective to the examination of day schools. We want to understand day schools in relation to the socio-cultural context from which they emerge and where they have impact. And again, we believe the cultural diversity of the papers presented here do justice to this goal, as do two of the keynote papers we will hear from Steve Cohen and Svi Gittelman, two eminent sociologists of contemporary Jewry who make sense of Jewish day schools in two very different cultural settings. Lastly, when we talk of reframing, we mean to review Jewish day schools in relation to insights derived from outstanding practitioners and researchers of public schooling. That is what tonight's session seeks, as I will explain shortly, and it is also a goal in tomorrow's keynote session with Ellen Goldring, someone who is North America's premier researcher of schools of choice. But before turning to tonight's presenters, let me first turn to Professor Steve Kaplan, Dean of the Faculty of Humanities at the Hebrew University, to bring greetings from the university. Thank you. Thank you very much. Uh, it's a pleasure to be here. I, I have to say that this time of the year, the two most important things that a dean does, uh, which are somewhat contradictory, is that uh, it's my job to open conferences. This is the fourth in 36 hours. Um, and to sign people's travel forms so as soon as the conferences are over, they can go off to other conferences <laughs> elsewhere. Actually, from my experience as, uh, as dean, um, my, my job would be much easier if it was possible to double the amount of travel money that faculty members had because it's much easier to run the faculty when the rest of the faculty members aren't around. <laughs> I want to say I'm impressed, tremendously impressed here um, at, at the gathering. Um, obviously, there are, are not an overwhelming number of football fans in the audience. I, I was prepared for something like the old days on the high holidays when you'd see the person listening to the World Series, you know, while, while the service was going on. Um, but um, on, a more, on, a, on a more serious note, um, as we've already begun to hear, the issue of day schools is an issue that uh, has 
aspects that interact or, or are relevant for every aspect of Jewish communities. Certainly as someone as, who you can hear who left the United States almost 30 years ago, it's startling for me to hear the numbers that are being cited because when I was growing up in the United States, the numbers that were in day schools were tiny and it was a very distinctive segment of the, of the Jewish population. And I can only begin to imagine how this changes Jewish life in the United States. As someone who in recent years has been involved in higher education in Israel, I can only ask, ask questions which, I, which unfortunately because of my other responsibilities I won't be here to hear many of the answers um, about how this phenomena of these day schools and schools of choice in other areas um, interact with the constant cry that we hear for the need for diversity in education, for the issues that arise when you have homogeneous student bodies. Are we to understand the phenomena of day schools as part of what some people have described in other contexts as disengagement from the state? Yes, the schools have taken on all sorts of responsibilities, as you, as you said, but in many ways, aren't we um, part of a process in which responsibilities, which at least when I was growing up were considered to be the responsibility of the state, have once again returned to being the responsibility of local communities? Are day schools in some way part of the process that we see of privatization of so many aspects of what were once civil society with all the effects that that has for the gaps that develop between the haves and the have-nots. My experience working for the past two years with um, the Melton uh, people has been a wonderful experience. I have to say everyone who knows, in, in many ways I became tremendously involved with Melton as a dean in some ways by default. Um, that uh, I won't say that I won't say there was a feeling of being orphaned, but uh, you know, and certainly not of a, being abused. Uh, but but uh, there, there was certainly a, a ro room for a dean to become more involved than previous deans had have been. It's been one of my great satisfactions as dean to be involved with all the programs that the Melton uh, people have run. I want to take this opportunity to thank Howie for the work that he's, that, that he's done and to thank Mark Hirschman as chairman of the academic committee. Um, I wish all, again, I wish to welcome all of you on behalf of the university and wish you tremendously fruitful discussions. Thank you. Thank you, Professor Kaplan. I'm going to invite now uh, Dr. Howie Dietscher, the director of the Melton Center for Jewish Education, to also bring you greetings. For those in Buenos Aires, Shalom Aleichem, Miushalayim, everyone here, thank you very, very much for coming. This is really a momentous event for the Melton Center. I want to just say a few words by way of introduction to what I think this conference is all about. I'd like to tell you, share with you a story about the first Minister of Education of the Jewish people. It says the following, Rabbi Judah then said in the name of Rav, Verily, Rabbi Joshua ben Gamla should be remembered for good, for had it not been for him, the Torah would have been forgotten in Israel. For at first, the boy who had a father was taught Torah by him, while the boy who had no father did not learn. Later, they appointed teachers of boys in Jerusalem, and the boys who had fathers were brought to them, to the teachers, and were taught. But those who had no fathers were still not brought. So then they ordered that teachers should be appointed in every district. And they brought to them lads of the age of 16 or 17. And when a teacher was crossed with any of the lads, the lad, listen to this, would kick at him and run away. So then, Rabbi Joshua ben Gamla ordered that teachers should be appointed in every district and in every city, and that the boys should be sent to them at the age of six or seven years. This is the first minister of education, Rabbi Yeshua ben Gamla. And what you see, what I learned from this story is the interaction, the dynamic nature 
of Jewish education and the interrelationship between the community and the schools. The education is part and parcel of the community's responsibility. And Rabbi Yeshua ben Gamla, as the first minister of education, saw the way things were evolving. He saw the dynamic nature of Jewish education. And in light of that, he came up with a proposal that dealt with these issues as they evolved. For me, this is a story of Jewish education and one of the main ideas that I think we'll be wrestling with over the next two and a half days. I'd just like to thank everyone who's come and I'll, I've been privileged to also uh, give the final session so then I'll say additional thank yous because by then you'll have known what richness we've all received. But I would like just to thank at this point our three partners in this process. I'd like to thank the Partnership for Excellence in Jewish Education, PEJ. I'd like to thank the Jewish Agency for Israel, Jaffe. And I'd like to thank the JDC, the Joint Distribution Committee. This has really been a partnership effort whereby all four of the different bodies have gotten together and I believe in a very fruitful and respectful way have really built a program which I think is very exciting and very rich. And that is no easy feat. Anybody who's been involved in Jewish life knows how complicated this process can be. But at this point, I'd like to say, Nes Gadol Haya Po. Bruchim Abayim. Thank you, Howie. Uh, Jewish educators often speak of schools as vehicles for building community of Jewish community being built around and within schools. And although the last 10 years have in formal terms at least seen the emergence of what are called community day schools, educators are not always so successful in turning rhetoric into reality. This lack of success is one of the reasons why in planning this conference we turn to Deborah Meyer. Deborah has devoted her adult life to creating schools that build community often in circumstances that don't seem auspicious. Most well known among these schools are the Central Park East Secondary School in New York City, which she founded and led for more than 10 years, and the Mission Hill School in Boston, where she was principal from 1997 to 2005. Deborah has written about these schools in two compelling books, The Power of Their Ideas, Lessons for America from a Small School in Harlem, and In Schools We Trust. In fact, I'll use this opportunity to tell the person whoever I lent these two books to uh, to return them to me as soon as possible. <laughs> I don't joke. Um, reading these books, one quickly realizes that Deborah has figured out how schools should be run, how their physical spaces should be designed, and what kinds of conversations should be nurtured within them so that these places become communities for those who come to them every day and also for those whose lives are lived mainly beyond the school gate. At the university where we and students often vex over the gap between theory and practice, Deborah's work is salutary. Her work as an educator derives from a set, derives from a set of profound insights about how children learn and how they learn to get along. It is theory driven, but it is impressively practical. Public educators have known for some time that Deborah Meyer's work and ideas have profound implications for their practice, something reflected in the number of honorary degrees she's received from a roll call of America's outstanding educational institutions. But I think that we as Jewish educators interested in and perhaps obligated to build community within and beyond our schools have profound lessons to learn from Deborah's work as well. To help draw out some of those lessons, we will turn to two outstanding individuals from the field of Jewish education, Professor Michael Rosenack and Rabbi Josh Elkin. But first, let's turn to our keynote speaker, Deborah Meyer. Thank you. Get a last look at you. <coughs> when... Uh, when I was a child, people used to use the expression, uh, uh, you know, uh, break a leg when someone was about to do something, go on stage. But I never understood it. 
And I always assumed that they really were hoping that they would break a leg. And because any time I had to go on the stage, that was my hope too, that before I had to get up there, <laughs> I would break a leg, get a high fever. And if you can't hear me, please let me know. Um, no, that won't work. Well, so you don't hear me. And that was Gukin Bear's outcome. So, yeah. <laughs> so um, somewhere along the way, I will get. No, somewhere along, some, somewhere along the way, I'll stop being nervous. Uh, people sometimes say, "Don't you eventually?" get over this, given that you speak a lot? And the answer is, no, I never do. Uh, and uh, some, I, I try to remember to lower my expectations about what any speech is supposed to do. And as to my sort of touchstone, uh, I remember the time that at the end of a speech, I got a nice round of applause and was feeling you know, relatively self-confident that it, things had gone all right. I hadn't been in a disaster. And I walked down to the, uh, down from the podium, and a woman came up and said, you have transformed my life forever. And like every teacher in the world, you know, I thought, this is, this is, this is okay. She said, I'll never worry again about the kind of shoes <laughs> that I wear when I do public speaking. <laughs> Uh, but the truth of the matter is that may well have been the largest impact, greatest impact that one ever can have on another person. As one who has trouble with shoes, which is where I, why I wear such odd shoes, um, to have had such an influence that on someone's life may well be as much as one can expect of any speech. So I hope somebody here uh, will be so influenced. But it's part of what we all remember about teaching itself. It's never exactly what you thought you were out there trying to accomplish that your graduates come back years later to thank you for. And uh, the impact of, uh, of our childhood as well as our schooling and of individual friendships over the years is often uh, as fortuitous as the fact that they helped you think about your feet more sensibly. No, in any case, uh, my bona fides on addressing this topic is what I'm particularly nervous about. If I'm always nervous speaking, at least I know exactly who my audience is. Well, not exactly. I know enough of them. And second of all, uh, I know my own expertise in relationship to them. But um, I spent more than 40 years. I actually started teaching late in life. I spent more than 40 years as a teacher, principal, and writer, and speaker about public education in the United States. And it is not entirely clear, despite Alex's and my frequent correspondence on this, uh, how that connects with what this conference is about. But my father, at some point uh, in our childhood, told us that if ever confronted with a question in which we weren't sure we knew the answer, we could always reply by explaining how this reminded us of the Jewish question. <laughs> and then tell them everything we knew about the Jewish question, which was surely more than anyone wanted to know. <laughs> uh, but I said, said to him, uh, but Papa, suppose the question is about elephants. And he explained, well, you begin by saying that elephants are not like Jews. Now, Jews... <laughs> so here I am, turning my father's advice on its head as an excuse in part, in part, to take my granddaughter to see Jerusalem. And because I love talking about schooling and suspect that in some ways the question of schooling and Jewish education uh, connect, overlap. I'm, ho I'm hoping so. Um, now, I, it would be unfair to imply I come to it with no Jewish education. I never went to it. I went to private schools, I went to public schools, but, uh, and I had no, or any, of any, no sort of Jewish education whatsoever in one sense of the word. But I had another very deeply informal Jewish secular education at the hands of a family that was immersed in New York City's Jewish philanthropic intellectual life and to some extent international Jewish life between the 1920s and in 1970s. Uh, 
Both my parents were prominent leaders of Jewish organizations. My father was head of the United Jewish Appeal and Federation for his entire adult life. And my mother was president of both the International and National Councils of Jewish Women. Uh, an incident that which I'll tell you later. Uh, and our dinner table was always an exciting center for my own education, long before I could make much sense of it. It was still, still rings, it still powerful, resonates. Just as our library was always a delightful challenge, even if I assumed at the time how unlikely it would be that I could ever read all of it. So I had a rather romantic and egocentric notion of what lay at the heart of being a Jew. And it had to do with that dinner table and that library, with the habits of heart, mind, and work that epitomized my own experience as a Jew in New York City. I imagined Jewish education was built around the idea of the young being immersed in the culture, or as I would later say, the company of the adults they aspired, aspired to join and believed they were destined to become. That being educated was a process that started the immersion, exposure, and total acceptance, that started with immersion, exposure, and total acceptance and love. That was all there was to it. I assumed it was also argumentative, questioning, doubting. Tough was a positive word. It was, I took for granted, grounded in respectful uncertainties, but not therefore one that was less passionately dedicated to the truth. And I assume because my family's life was also immersed in social and political struggles for the defense and expansion of democracy, that these were also the habits of mind suited for a democratic society. In fact, I rather naively assumed that it was Judaism, not as I was told in school, ancient Greece, that was the founder of the democratic idea. The last time I spoke in Jerusalem, I uh, claimed that democracy rested on two simple habits of mind, skepticism and empathy, informed and expanded upon by knowledge and reflection. Neither empathy nor skepticism are easy ways to live. And since I was last here, my optimism on behalf of both have been shaken both by the difficult, by the rise of uh, Christian fundamentalism and its assault on any forms of skepticism in my own country, and the difficulty of empathizing even with people one has spent one's life in close friendship with as I look around the world. The wars that are going on in every continent in the last decade between people who have every reason in the world to empathize with each other to know each other well, to imagine, be able to imagine being each other. The kibbutz experience I had when I first came here was always one I had uh, that I used to explain empathy, the idea of stepping into the shoes of others. I would uh, explain to my friends back in the States that the idea that a general might come off duty and go back to the kibbutz and have to take a rotation in any one of many different tasks on the kibbutz. I said men, meant that they had designed the kibbutz with the mindset that any one of them might have to serve in any job on the kibbutz. Which meant when you were thinking about the laundry room, you weren't thinking about the maid who worked in the laundry room, but about yourself in the laundry room. And wouldn't you like a nice view while you were uh, doing the laundry? I remember looking at all great glorious homes in the United States of the rich and thinking that their kitchens were always so appallingly um, badly designed, understandably, since they, the people who designed them were never going to be working in the kitchen. Yet the kibbutz and that spirit is harder to find today, probably here as it is back at home. Even among Jews especially, empathy is sometimes hard to hold on to. Before I spoke at Brandeis University on this topic, I had lunch with the headmaster of a Jewish day school in Massachusetts. Is he here, Danny Lerman? No. Uh, who insisted to me that the idea of diversity was, my idea of diversity was insufficiently broad. His task, which aimed at bringing reform, conservative, and orthodox Jews together under one roof to learn about Judaism, the world, and each other, was, he said, at least, if not more difficult. 
as mine as headmaster of schools with black, white, and Latino students in East Harlem. But then I remembered that the last time, uh, last night, as I was talking to a few of you, that in 1956 I took a trip with my mother through South America uh, in the, for the purpose of, for the first time, bringing the Sephardic, German Jewish, and Ashkenazi communities into one room together. And that in most of these communities throughout some, else America, the idea was shocking. A few refused the suggestion and the invitation. Uh, it was more important to keep their differences than to hear my mother. Uh, that's, that was a shocking lesson and reminder to me that times have maybe not gotten worse, but it's a reality that I often push down when I think about the possibilities of empathy. It's a reminder that the kind of skepticism and empathy needed to nourish democracy does not come, to say the least, naturally. Now that's an important and scary idea. Such habits are not essential to our being humans. They're not naturally alien to it. They're possibilities. They're deeply rooted possibilities even, but they will not flower naturally. Our skepticism flourishes best, in fact, in infancy, in early childhood. When the tr world truly looks fresh and skepticism, if you will, is merely another way of looking at that openness of the young child to the world's many possibilities. Our mindset tends to narrow as we get older for both good and bad reasons, but necessary reasons. We need to conform to set ways of seeing the world, to particular definitions of it, to names for things. The essential freshness is both a blessing and a necessity to rid ourselves of. New ideas in the process become therefore threatening to the ongoing life of a community, which rests on norms that are largely unquestioned anymore, accepted as so normal that we cannot imagine otherwise. Survival even depends on this and yet it also closes us up to those who have reached different norms. Similarly, while in childhood we might imagine ourselves to be cats and dogs, cars and trains and magical fairies, by the time we reach pre-adolescence, maybe even seven or eight, and who knows how much earlier in today's culture, we have narrowed it down considerably, eventually imagining ourselves mostly just as people like ourselves. It would take vigorous, and I um, don't know about uh, in the education circles here in Israel, but I purposely avoid the word rigorous. I don't know, is that the current word here? Rigorous? No? Avoid it like the plague. Uh, it may be coming from America, though, so watch out. Uh, vigorous and sustained training to create habits compatible with empathy and skepticism. It habits that could withstand the pressure and stresses of real life, yet take them into account. During the past 40 years, I've been exploring the implications of this simple idea. And I do it today, even at a time when early childhood, where I felt it had its roots, is being threatened. As I often pointed out, I know how to put away my keys so that I always can find them when needed. They go in that zipper on the inside of my pocketbook right there. I could answer that on any standardized test. The trouble is, they're not always there, especially in times of stress when I need to find them fastest is precisely the time when they're least likely to be there because that's the time when I forget to put them there. What a good education for democracy requires is the early development of habits that are so strong and hard to abandon that in times of stress, we fall back on them, not on their opposite. When all is well and life is going your way, it's easy to respect views one finds distasteful. 
or to allow a disagreeable neighbor to coexist with you in the same block, or to imagine how others may view the world so differently than one does oneself, or to put oneself in the shoes of a harmless beggar on the street. But the beggar threatens your way of life, or the neighbor chooses a lifestyle that offends one deeply, it gets harder. So for nation states as well. People as individuals or collectives have a harder time respecting their neighbors when they feel threatened themselves. It's so obvious, of course. And we all have a harder time imagining ourselves the losers if most of our lives we've been the winners. And sometimes, in fact, if we've been the losers, we're just as hard a time wanting to identify with other losers. So both these those accustomed to dominate as well as those accustomed to being a minority have different but equally powerful reasons to struggle against skepticism and empathy. How do we hold on to difficult, deviant stance if we admit to uncertainty? How do we imagine being losers if all life has taught us that losers probably deserve their fate in some fashion or we'd like to believe so? Can schooling overcome such barriers to the qualities of heart and mind critical, in my opinion, to the long-term nourishing of democracy? Can they build the kind of community that democracy already assumes exists and is a form of when community itself begins to lose its appeal? It's a tall order and perhaps a utopian one. Perhaps the easier answer lies in limiting the communal body, defining it sufficiently narrowly so that neither habit is often required. But I think it's becoming harder and harder to do that in virtually every corner of the world. Furthermore, in largely agrarian communities, most of the exchanges between citizens, however defined, were face-to-face -face among people whose path often crossed and whose interests thus were clearly often intersecting. No longer the case for so many of those in today's world. Is democracy then passe? And I want to tell you, quite frankly, yes, possibly. Or at least, out of a contest for a period of time. I'm not, I'm an optimist in the long term. I'm fearful about the short term. But that's when I go back to that vision I have of democratic education at my family's dinner table because it was a conversation, a contentious dinner table. Probably not great for digesting food, as my mother would remind us occasionally. And brought together people with very different lifestyles, viewpoints and histories, and occasionally involved one of my parents saying to one of them, I don't know why I've invited you here, I wish you were out of my house. And above all, of vastly different ages. But uh, in most cases, as my memory serves me, and probably nostalgically, romantically doesn't serve me, it held. It held. What was required was my mother's insistence on respectful language, or the presumption that those around the table could, but for, e, but for, but for, be in each other's shoes. We were, as kids and adults, never allowed to refer to other human beings in any kind of slang, shorthand, derogatory manner. In the midst of World War II, if the word Japs slipped out of my mouth, my mother was outraged. It's a habit I have held on to in schools of education and in schools today. This style, the dinner table conversation of joining company with adults, would of course not look the same in every family or community. But whatever the style, the assumption that you were learning to become an adult through keeping company with adults was pretty universal until a few centuries ago, and largely alive and well, even a century or less ago. It is not any longer. Two relatively new phenomena facing us following World War II have deeply educational implications. The first, the presumption that the natural advanced state of human governance is democracy itself, which only needed now that seems hard to believe that that should be a threat to democracy, but I believe it has. It no longer seemed as though you needed specific intellectual training to govern a democracy, but just a free market, and all else would be well. And I'm not going to talk about that tonight. That's another whole lecture. But number two, 
was the belief that it was possible that it was no longer possible for any citizen to actually learn what was necessary for adult life in the natural course of keeping company with adults. This second is what I want to address and discuss the responses I came up with and the dilemmas they pose for us. Up until recently, young people learned virtually all about being grown-ups. And I'm going to repeat this over and over again. They learned, turned novices, turned into experts by putting the two together, largely in situations in which the number of novices was overwhelmed by the number of experts, somewhat the reverse of our now, our common, common contemporary assumptions. Today, no natural community of adults and young people in my communities, where I know best, underpin young people's growing up years. The segregation of ages and the impersonal anonymity of most settings in which the young live have made shallow the idea of community itself. When I was born, most, every American, most Americans had not yet dropped into secondary school, much less graduated. But by 1950, schooling had become the way of life from 6 to 18 for the vast majority of young people of all social classes. And in school, the young did not keep company with adults. Their teachers did not largely teach them by example but by didactic lessons. They taught about math. They taught about physics. They taught about their expertise. It was like learning to drive a car through the, in the driving school with a, and no exam, opportunity to get behind the wheel or to drive on the long side an expert driver. What was required was not close observation and imitation, but a style of learning unique to schooling itself. The authentic real world of both work and play grew remoter from young people. One did not join with adults engaged in worthy work, nor did they just join, nor did such adults join with the young in their work. They lived increasingly separated lives. For the first time in the history, I claim, of the human species, young people knew fewer and fewer adults the closer they came to adulthood. By the year 2000, starting as young as four and lasting until their 20s, the young live largely peer-dominated lives, focused on agendas set elsewhere and not by the school, nor by the democracy, nor by the community. By 1950, a huge voracious industry hungry to cater to this new clientele, whose values were thus increasingly shaped in settings separate from the family or the larger adult community. They knew their targets better than we, their teachers, or their families did. A new youth culture funded by the self-interested industries of advertising had to be contended to, with their eye on the pocket money to be made from the young, eager to turn them not into lifelong learners, but into lifelong consumers, with the habits of mind and heart of consumers, customers, not scholars. Uh, my home in New York City was occasionally been used for, for various reasons, for short TV spot ads. And generally they spend about two days to make a 30 second ad, bring in tons of food, dozens of people, and uh, pay me uh, something for the use of the space. And every year it strikes me, used to strike me with amazement, the attention that was paid to pulling together those 30 seconds. And I think to myself, in New York City at least, there wasn't a single day in the 182 school day years where teachers were brought together to do anything as carefully attended to 
as the composition of those 30 seconds. And in fact, the amount of money that was spent on those 30 seconds was more than the entire budget for my small school in East Harlem. And it had been preceded, and I included in that, all the focus group time to try to understand the customer who was going to glance this 30 seconds. We've increased that now in some cities in the United States to one or two days, although largely they're wasted. But at least the concept was that we now need one or two days to prepare for 182, uh, something the advertising industry knows better than we do. In contrast to the pale model of teaching and learning that we offer them in school and its boring vision of adultness, it's no wonder that the vision on the screen seems more exciting than lifelong learning. And besides, it was unclear what the point of lifelong learning was and remains to most young people. When I asked kindergarten children, they told me it was to learn to raise your hand and share. I thought their parents might be able to teach them those two things. Uh, they added to that when pressed reading, when pressed about why reading was important because that's the only way you could be promoted to the next grade and why was that important so you could get promoted to the next grade, get promoted to the next grade, get promoted. And when it was all over, you could finally stop reading, right? No, because you might have children and you needed to learn to read so you could read to your children so that they could go to school and get promoted and get promoted. <coughs> it was a duty at best and at some age we began to press the fact that it would bring them more money if they had, were well educated. And even citizenship, when we threw that in, was another duty. It was like picking up the garbage in the hall, being, holding open doors, and other less than exciting enterprises. Academia was mostly a route to higher paying jobs. Try to persuade a six or seven year old that that's a reason to come to school for 182 days a year. From the day I first rather accidentally started working in Chicago public schools as a sub, I understood profoundly the danger democracy faced if schools were in any way intended to be a bulwark on its behalf. One of the things I learned, of course, how interesting my own surprise was. Having been educated in an upper middle class New York City Jewish community, I realized how very little I understood about the schooling that the vast majority of my fellow citizens were engaged in, in this publicly available one. But to my wondrous delight when I equally accidentally found myself as a teacher of a kindergarten class of 30 on Chicago's South Side, I realized what schooling could be and how easily it had the potential to dovetail with democratic aspirations, that it was indeed an answer if not to any question that was being asked, unfortunately. Yet schools could create the kind of communities that produced lifelong learners with the habits of mind, heart, and work that an increasingly more mobile, globalizing society needed to retain its soul, sanity, and possibly the planet itself. And it could do so for all kids together. That it could do so for all kids together, and that the same thing that worked for rich kids worked for poor kids. The same kid thing that worked for white middle class Jewish kids in Riverdale worked for poor black and Latino kids in Chicago South Side. They didn't need a different kind of education. Those 30 kids restored my faith in the capacity of every ordinary human being to engage in intellectual inquiry, to tolerate uncertainty, and to experience empathy. And I also learned, a decade later, the capacity of organized schooling on the same basis to enhance such human qualities through the communal life of the school itself. I had a student in my class. It was a Board of Education lesson we were all supposed to teach. It was called um, Telling Living from Non-Living Things. And uh, as a new teacher, I followed some of those scripts, and I got myself a big bunch of stuff. This was in my first year teaching kindergarten in Central Harlem. And um, I sat them all around a circle, and I had a box called living and a box called non-living. I thought, and I explained to the kids that we were going to put the living things in this box, and each kid should come up and put things in the right place. And I said, uh, now first, holding up a rock, 
who wants to put this in the right place? And Daryl came up and uh, put it in the living box. Now I thought he was kind of putting me on or maybe he had mixed up the boxes and I started trying to direct his proper response. And he came to the defense of the idea of a rock being a living thing in the most extraordinary way. And in fact, it totally convinced the class I was definitely losing this argument. And uh, it was even sort of convincing to me. Now he partly based it on a misunderstanding of a story I had said, told them all in the beginning of the year when we went to Central Park and looked at the rocks about how the glaciers, I, don't, I hope there's no geologists in this room, but how the glaciers had came down and moved across and blah, 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 and how they changed size and shape. And that was part of his defense, that they were moving the living objects who had traveled here with their own history and story. Uh, in any case, I put the lesson aside and thought, I need to do a little more thinking about this before we reach for the next object. And sure enough, of course, the next object, which was going to be a leaf that I picked up on the way to school, uh, that was an interesting question. Is it a living or not living thing? Was this whole particular dichotomy, what about dead things? Which did they belong in? And so forth and so on. In any case, it turned out that uh, we explored it for months. And we explored it for months precisely because kids were intrigued by the idea of living and non-living, but for very different reasons than our syllabus. But if we were going to use schools in that manner to take seriously the powerful and wonderful ideas that children of all, of all backgrounds bring with them to school. We have to change the way we think of schooling. For this purpose, we have to make a lot of fundamental changes, at least on my side of the Atlantic. Begin with, we'd need a deeper discussion of the purpose of the public education so that it seemed relevant to anyone that what was important was not whether he knew that rocks were non-living, that was the right label for rocks, or whether he knew how to think about living and non-living, to think about categorization, to think about the wonders of the world around. <coughs> but, but a healthy discussion about our national as well as international planetary self-interest might well be in order, and it's hard to do because it challenges deeply held convictions. I was just at a gathering at Amherst two weeks ago, and the, the new president uh, of Amherst College described how the school was expanding its diversity. More scholarships and more affirmative action. Without, in his words, lowering our standards, i.e. SAT scores and rank in class. What's worth arguing about is precisely those standards. Lani Guinier, a noted legal scholar, pointed out that there's a direct link between LSAT scores, and those you probably know, that's the law school, preschool, pre-law school exams. There's a, a direct link between those scores and pro bono work as a lawyer, in reverse order. While high, high LSAT scores might correlate with high post-law school income, it's quite the opposite when one thinks about post-law school pro bono work. So if we asked about the question of LSAT in correlation with standards for public common good, we might regard that test in quite a different light. We might argue that the standards for elite schools ought to favor students for whom there's reason to believe that their success will add to the common good, not just their own pocketbooks or the elite institutions that they are likely to serve in the future. That's a conversation about schooling that we are not willing to start. What kind of intellectual habits are in the common good? What habits help sustain a democratic society? And if we don't think that's the business of schooling to ask that question, where is this other institution we've set up where we're supposed to inquire about those? Is that the family's job to do on the side? Where else do we imagine such a discussion would take place and such habits might be formed? So when we started our school, we started, as I was a kindergarten teacher, 
with the kindergarten classroom as an example of such an environment where such habits, I argued, were central. The habits of skepticism and empathy, or at least benignly allowed. The world of childhood play and fantasy, the creating of things, the making and doing, the actual craftsmanship of trying to do something well, of talking out of, on, from different roles, while also living amongst and feeding off the world of adult occupations and hobbies and interactions. The two worlds need each other, the child's picture of the world and the real world. <coughs> the world of play is a variation on the one children witness and is an attempt to make sense of it, to tame it, and to build off of it. And as we as adults understand and learn from it, as we allow it to happen, not only does it help the child, but it helps us as grown-ups for the first time begin to remember what it is that we're taking for granted in the world we've created. It was the intellectually most exciting period for me, being a kindergarten teacher, as I began to re-examine questions such as what's living and non-living. It's not a frill, and a nation unable to provide for play endangers its future. There are times in history where it's hard to allow children play. They find it even then, in the oddest ways. It's an essential, not a frill. Current pre-K in uh, New York, I just read in the, uh, some New York news magazine called Ed Week, uh, that there's a new state law, and I can't remember, let's pretend it's Maryland, but don't remember that too well because I'm not sure, uh, that all um, children must be provided a summer of pre-K before kindergarten. They can be provided the whole year, but they at least have to be given uh, that summer before pre-K to get ready, a summer of pre-K to get ready for kindergarten. The law states that they have to attend school uh, for... Uh, eight hours a day for a minimum of six weeks over the summer and uh, just of instructional time. And just to be really tough about it, they say nap time is not to be included in the eight hours a day. I once looked at New York, the California's standards for kindergarten in the arts and they included things like the children shall be able to identify different genres of visual arts, uh, that they will be able to discuss art in terms of line and point, and it went on and on. And the same in dance, and I thought to myself, this might be a PhD study, but this was a kindergarten curriculum. Instead of letting childhood wither away as they are inducted into the world of schooling, and through schooling, not vice versa, into adulthood, we could purposely organize our schooling in ways that held on to that good kindergarten practice, disciplining it in ways that allowed them to be effective in broader context. That's what Central Park East and CPS and later Mission Hill and hundreds of schools that played with these ideas on a K-12 basis built in New York City and later in Boston over the last 30 years. We built our schools to be small. That was already a radical idea in New York City. I don't know what it is here. And by small, we really meant small. Small enough so the faculty could literally sit around one common dinner table. Back to my dinner table. I think that's around 20. Ideal class size, ideal faculty size. You can extrapolate out how many school students that means and complex and diverse enough so that no one felt constrained by the fact of intimacy to feel obliged to be overly conformist to the group norms, but large enough, but small enough, so that no one could be marking homework while the faculty had a so-called discussion. Imagine, in the average American high school, I don't believe you do anything so foolish here, uh, the faculty itself is more than 100. Uh, they're at least the size of this group here. And the odds are that all the people in the back there are marking homework while I talk. They may be now. They may be now. 
especially if it's near the end of the year. Uh, it meant, secondly, overlapping constituencies. Parents with purposefully diverse stories and biases, along with teachers with some of the same, and kids of varying ages and interests, overlapping with each other in many ways. I'm going to come back to the parent question because that was a very critical part of what I want to talk about. But he says five minutes and I just can't do it in five minutes. So that's going to take a little longer. I'm sorry. Uh, really? That was halfway when you said that? Hmm. He meant, uh, it meant introducing into the community interesting outsiders, people who were not defined as teachers, artists, mechanics. I'll skip. It meant defining our intellectual tasks. That was the biggest thing. First we tried putting on the wall everything we thought every child should know by the time they were 18. And when we got up to lists of hundreds and thousands and a half, nobody on the humanities side of the faculty could answer any of the essential questions that the physicists faculty thought no one at 18 should not understand deeply. We decided we were approaching it the wrong way. And what we ended up with five habits of mind, which some of my friends claim uh, are a little too Jewish in tone. But uh, taken together, they add up to empathy and skepticism. Taken separately, there are a series of questions. The first of which is, how do you know what you know? What's your evidence? Second of all, it's try looking at it from a different perspective. Imagine walking in someone else's shoes. The third, have you ever run into this before? Is there a pattern? Fourth, what if we change this or that? What would happen? And finally, so what? Who cares? Does it make any difference? Anyhow, <coughs> we figured these would actually do for physics, for chemistry, for mathematics, for childhood play, you name it. And that if we just could get these five habits of asking questions over 12 years, we'd have made a great impact if we did them ourselves as grown-ups. We had to build a grown-up culture <coughs> as powerful as we could if the kids were going to join it as young people. We grouped kids in ways that increased the number of adults to young people. Older and younger students together, more experts of more types, and we created environments where adults spent more than one year with the same child. We built multi-age classrooms. We had ways, even in a small community, in part so the kids would know the teachers well, but in part because of the importance of kids and parents and teachers building a triangle together. You know, it's by April you finally get to sort of know the parents, but by June, thank God, they're going to be going. We wanted one where you'd have to stick with that idea. And in April, the most ornery parent you realize you're going to have for another whole year, you had to figure out some way for the two of you to work together. We built a classroom pedagogy around critique, the same pedagogy that was applied to the faculty. We had to critique each other's work in all the various ways in which critique takes place. The workspaces needed to be communal for this to happen, open to people across disciplines and ages, offering many tools, formal and informal, for getting to the bottom of things. While some schedules were required, we tried as far as possible to make the scheduling follow the school need rather than the other way around. We set before the kids both shared study of common texts and themes and rooms for individual explorations, a more personal kind. The large themes were often universal, They'd be studied at virtually any age, over and over again. And in Mission Hill, the entire school from kindergarten through seventh grade all studied the same thing together. The eighth grade was some variation on that. But the seventh grade all studied the same topics together. The hallway was our central square where people could see ways in which children from kindergarten through seventh grade tackled the same themes and questions. And it also meant we did it so that every child studied the same topic once as a young child and once as an older child, came back to the study of, so that they wouldn't say, as so many students of mine in the high school would say, American history, we're going to study that again. We did that in fourth grade. Sometimes the studies were very super specific. Uh, when we came to Mission Hill, we discovered the school was surrounded by snails, land snails. I don't know what they were doing there. We, we were sort of startled in the middle of Boston. Uh, but 
it wasn't at all our intention to study. We were going to study the neighborhood or something like that. But the neighborhood became the snails. And we spent a large part of the next 10 years of their school going back and forth, back and back to this question of the snails. And I was happy to explain to parents that a very eminent Boston scientist, Stephen Jay Gould, had gotten his primary central uh, topic was snails. And he had spent a lifetime studying it, so your kids will spend 10 years on it. <laughs> then we required students to present their accumulated work to committees consisting of faculty, external experts, and a person of their own choosing. We assured them they didn't have to get it right the first time since the committee's task was both to critique and to judge. We love them all, we said, and if you have to stay here longer, won't we be happy? They groaned. And in the end, the faculty on behalf of its students, their families, and the community had to take responsibility then for the whole. That was so essential for the kids and their families also to realize this was their school that we were all parties to the judging of the standards of the school. This did not belong to some other, some other group. The families, no matter how argumentative they often were with us, despite the difficulty and pains, and there are a few teachers I know in the United States who totally believe in this stuff of wanting parent involvement in schools. Uh, that again may be different here. But uh, despite that fact, it was the strength of those bonds that helped us through the tough times for our kids. It helped us make, take seriously the fact that for many families, the idea of going on for college, to college, their, their reluctance about the kids going on to college and especially going away for college was not based on lack of interest in education, but on the complexity of a family's network of helping each other that made the child that left home a serious problem for the children who remained at home. How, neat, how much of assumptions we made about how we could know whether the families supported the school's objectives were themselves complicated by cultural interactions that we were not good at yet. The final graduation standards, though, represent the school as a whole, its honor and its reputation. This sense that a, the school belongs to us is an odd one belongs to us all. I visited a small school out in California a year ago, I apologize, and uh, the, uh, uh, the, the, <laughs> the teachers uh, at the end of the day asked uh, me and my colleague Mark to stay and tell them about our reactions to the day. And uh, they, began, they began with some sort of general kvetching time. One teacher said in an irritable voice, these kids act at times as if they own the place. Another noted that they ought to close off one of the two doors into the uh, this staff room that was filled with staff desks and staff uh, library and so forth, because kids kept coming in one door, walking through, looking at them all, and going out the other two on their way from class to class. And after a little more of this fetching, they turned to us, and I told them that Mark and I had spent a wonderful day, punctuated early in the afternoon by Mark turning to me and saying, you know, these kids act as if they own the place. Uh, in response to observing one of many acts of care, kindness, and respect, they showed the place and each other. And then we noted how rare it was that youngsters, in adolescents above all, were interested in what the faculty was doing when they were in class with them. And what a remarkable tribute it was to the culture of that place that the kids were dropping by to see what their teachers were doing when not with them. Most of the kids I know, including my own children, used that, in that precious in-between classroom time for seeing what each other are doing, not to find out more about the faculty's culture. The idea that the faculty even have one, what a remarkable thing that they already think you do, we told them. We had a good laugh, but behind that laugh is a reminder of how deeply we have built the walls between ourselves and our young, and how damaging that is to becoming citizens of a shared culture. We met often as a staff, that's the other thing about our schools, often, and we invited others to join us. We didn't have even a, prof when people said, what's your professional development plan? I said, it's us. We work it out as we go along. We needed it to explore the qualities of discourse we cared about, the forms of co-responsibility for our environment, how we treated each other, 
how we actually saw each other as a very diverse staff itself. We examined our own practices. We didn't see the wall, four walls of those schools as source for all our answers. We built in time for students to work outside the school, to take responsibility for other parts of the world. And these too helped expand the network kids had of adults whom they could call upon in later life. The expansion of networks for young people with adults, not just with each other. It's no surprise that so many of our graduates became teachers, uh, I suppose. But it's also amazing in interviews with, held with them afterwards, how many of them find life interesting and remind us that we told them that boredom is a waste of time and boredom is a threat to life, not just something we have to survive. It is, after all, what in part sustains us through hard times, wondering what tomorrow will bring, being curious enough about the world. As at this age, the great threat of death is not that I will die. I used to say, if I die. If, oh, but all the questions about the world that I will not have the answer to. And I want to end then with something I happened to read on the way over in the New York Times that relates to this and to what I've said. It's in the New York Times Magazine last Sunday about addiction. And it came to me because I was thinking about the extraordinary number of children in our schools who take drugs for a variety of things. The state of health of children, mental and moral and social health of our children. And this John Moyers, Bill Moyers son, William Moyers, had been a, an addict for many years. And he spoke to an MID conference and uh, he ends up saying, for us addicts, and I take this now far broader than addicts, recovery is more than just taking a pill or getting a shot. Recovery is also about the spirit, about dealing with that hole in the soul. And it is the hole in the soul that our schools can have a remarkable impact on, even as, and terribly, sadly as, we do nothing about the rest of the world that surrounds that school. Thank you very much. Thank you uh, so much, Deborah. I think I can say that we've learned a lot more than about your style of shoes. Uh, questions far more uh, profound than that. I'm not going to suggest what they are. I'm going to hand over very quickly to Rabbi Josh Elkin, who many of you will know. Uh, Josh was, the, for some 20 years, the head of the Solomon Shekhar Day School of Greater Boston, where he made his mark as an outstanding educator and school leader. For the last 10 years, he's been the executive director of the Partnership for Excellence in Jewish Education, the outstanding grant-making and advocacy agency for Jewish day schools in North America, an organization that is seen by other nonprofit bodies as a model of intelligence, adaptability, adaptability, and creativity. In a decade under Josh's leadership, Pige has transformed the discourse of day school education in North America, bringing sophistication and energy, smarts, to a field whose potential was sorely underdeveloped. It gives me great pleasure to invite one accomplished institution builder to respond to another. Thank you. This has to stay right like that. OK. Thank you very much for that wonderful introduction. It's really an honor to respond to, to Deborah, who really has been a, a, a teacher and a uh, just an incredible role model to so many educators, including myself. But first, I want to offer my congratulations to Alex and to the entire Melton Center for conceiving, planning, and implementing this magnificent conference. And as the executive director of PEGE, and on behalf of two fellow staff members, Bonnie Hausman and Suzanne Kling, from our staff, we're going to be presenting a paper as part of the conference. <clears throat> we want to say how privileged we are to be co-sponsors of this gathering. I want to respond to and elaborate on a few key points that Deborah made and uh, points that she made here and also points that appear in some of her writing. The first point takes me back to the first time I heard Deborah, and I heard her on public radio. 
it was on National Public Radio, and I think Christopher Lydon was interviewing you, and I actually went and got a copy of the tape, and I actually uh, summarized the whole thing onto five pages and gave it out to uh, the PEED staff because I thought it was just so profound. And I recall being so moved, particularly by her deep belief that our children need to have much more contact with many more adults, as she said today, keeping the company of adults, not just way beyond spending time just with teachers. It must be structured in, and the thing that makes Deborah such a credible advocate for this is that both at uh, the Harlem School and at the Mission Hill School, she actually did this. And so she is the proof text that this is possible. It's not pie in the sky. And the fact that very few schools have the quantity of adults interacting with young people doesn't mean that it's not a, uh, a vision and a value that has to be thrown out as a challenge to all of us. Why more adults? Because young people need to watch adults do what they do in the real world. Young people need to have things to aspire to based on the adult models that they see. The theme of increasing adult contact for our kids represents to me a vitally important perspective for Jewish day schools, both in general education and in Jewish education, the Judaic part of the program, and also in anything in the program that is integrated. And it's vitally important to the theme of this conference, for adults can and do serve as bridges connecting the school to the broader community. Let me offer a few very quick examples. In the area of the general academic disciplines, to bring in scientists, to bring in mathematicians, to bring in artists, to bring in retired people who had distinguished careers in various fields where various domains were applied. One thing that came to my mind also thinking about this is an increasing number of Jewish day schools, at least in North America, who are finding themselves putting their campuses, their permanent campuses for the next generation, right next to assisted living and senior citizen facilities, largely for reasons having to do with the fact that the land's there, and maybe some sense of it'll be nice, they can visit, they can learn what it is to take care of the elderly, but let's flip the whole thing around and say, what about bringing the senior citizens into the school, not because they're old and because they're challenged, but because they have wisdom and they have knowledge and craft to share with the young. We have a lot to do in this area. It's a real challenge to us, and Judaically as well. We have leaders of Jewish organization. We have synagogue leaders. We have rabbis. We have federation leaders. We have writers. We have commentators. We have scholars who remain outside the walls of our school. Now, we've been ahead for 20 years. I know how busy it is. I know how hard it is. I know there's so many more immediate things to do. But in the schools that are doing this, and there are schools and there are Jewish day schools that are doing this, the impact is profoundly important. And in terms of the integrators, we have people who incorporate both general and Judaic into their lives. We have politicians, people like Joseph Lieberman. We have Hollywood personalities. We have Shomer Shabbat journalists. We have Sadaka and Tikkun Olam heroes. We have a lot of people who are doing very interesting stuff who have a place inside our schools, but we have to invite them in. And as Deborah has written, people learn in two ways. They learn by observing others, and they learn by trying things out for themselves. And I think both of those types of learning happen when you increase dramatically the number of adults who are in the school. But increasing the number of adults within our school also connects to Deborah's comments about education for democracy. If we care about democracy, our students need to see adults doing democracy. Deborah emphasized two qualities or habits of mind essential to education for democracy. It's interesting that in her remarks tonight she chose to, uh, for the first one, to use the term skepticism. Um, uh, as I read uh, an earlier draft of her paper, I chose open-minded intelligence or the idea of wrestling or fighting with ideas, the very opposite of fundamentalism. That this is one of the qualities that we need to develop. And the second one, of course, the quality of empathy, which she spoke about this evening. We need to expose our students to adults who have personally cultivated and developed these habits. Hopefully teachers and administrators have developed them, but we've got a lot of help that we can bring in to our schools by inviting adults in the community who have uh, experience with these qualities and have demonstrated their competency in these areas. And these habits cut across all the disciplines. They cut across general domains of learning, Judaic, and all of the integrated programs that we have. 
And I think it's noteworthy, and I'll just take a moment because this could be a whole other uh, discussion, that the habits of mind that she has cited, I believe, are actually quite compatible with Jewish teaching and values. I'll give four basic examples. The other respondent, and my teacher, Professor Mike Rosenack, uh, he could uh, give you many, many more. I'll give you some basic ones. In the area of open-minded intelligence, I couldn't help but think about the first bakasha, the first petition in the daily Amidah, where we praise God as being chonein hadat, person who, 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 who uh, shows favor upon us by granting us the capacity to have knowledge, to have wisdom, to pursue knowledge and wisdom. This is something we say three times a day. Okay, and in terms of this idea of the fight for ideas, what other tradition has the tradition of a machloket, the rabbinic word for a disagreement? Or going even further, the idea of a machloket l'shem shemayim. There's such a thing as a machloket that's for the sake of heaven, that it's so, it's lofty to disagree. The whole Gemara would be probably one-third of its size if we took out all the second opinions out of it, and the third and the fourth opinions. We have a culture that has nurtured this, and so we, we've got a running head start in our schools to be able to make this habit come alive. And on the empathy front, we have, we have texts in our Torah and in rabbinic literature, texts like Vahavta Lareacha Kamocha, love our neighbor, love our friend as ourselves, and Al Tadinet Chavercha Ad Shetagiel Makomo in Pirkei Avot. Don't judge your fellow neighbor until you stand in his or her place. And so we've got, we've got some material within our own heritage that dovetails, I think, very nicely with these um, qualities that Deborah has thrown out to us as being uh, really essential to the cultivation of democracy and the building of a certain kind of community within our schools and within our Jewish community as a whole. Bringing in more adults of different ages from within the academic domains and their applications, as well as adults who exhibit these essential quality, habits of mind can create over time, I believe, a two-way relationship between school and community. You can bring people into the school from the outside, and you can also take people, particularly the young people and their teachers, and you can take them from the school out into the community. And I'll say that this, by having this kind of multiple age setting, we can really build a multi-generational school setting where kids and adults of different ages spend much more time together, break down the barriers between the school and the outside world, have different ages in the school and thereby make the school be much more like what the community is on the outside. And parenthetically, I should say that with having adults of different ages, I'd like to mention one other angle of this multiple uh, uh, a generation piece. One wonderful lay leader in the New York area, Matthew Marillis, uh, for the first time a number of weeks ago, spoke about the financing. That's a whole other conference, but I'm just going to mention in general that the financing of Jewish day school education has to be seen as a multi-generation phenomenon also. So it's not about one generation carrying the load. It's about parents. It's about grandparents. It's about senior citizens in the community all coming forward to share responsibility. And I'll say something about that briefly at the end of my remarks. Four additional points, very briefly, that I'd like to touch on, some of which flow from Deborah's remarks, some of which were things that just came to my mind as I was thinking about uh, responding this evening. John Dewey's fam famous work, School and Society, raises some questions about what the relationship is between these two. Does one serve the other? Does school prepare for the existing society? Or does school challenge the existing society? Let's look at this through the lens of the Judaic mission of our day school. I'm going to take particularly the community day schools, the non-denominational schools, and to give a sense exactly how tough the answering of Dewey's question is for these schools. There are some constituents in community day schools who believe that day schools are the revolutionary force, the wedge into Jewish renewal and Jewish renaissance and Jewish values for the future, while there are others who see the Jewish day school as merely a gateway into the workforce, into an elite university, and the Jewish stuff will be, at best, tolerated. These two things are on a collision course, and they represent a major challenge for any day school that has constituents within its four walls who have such a different conception of the relationship of what's going on in the school to the outside society. 
Uh, Yossi Prager of the Avichai Foundation has written eloquently on the dangers of the Judaic mission of these schools being boiled down over time to the lowest common denominators. And these are things that we really have to worry about. Tremendous source of tension that really is right at the fabric of what the relationship with these schools are to the community. Second, a very different perspective than Dewey that skirts the whole school and society question completely and gets out of the whole question of neither one of them serves the other. It's a whole other agenda. And for this, I'm going to quote another wonderful teacher, Walter Ackerman, who taught in these walls in Beersheba and at the Melton Center and at the Mandel Institute. Uh, Aki, as he was known, Allah Shalom. Were he alive, he would absolutely most certainly be with us in this room at this moment. And by invoking his teaching, I'm connecting to him as, as someone who's been uh, so influential on me. He issued a challenge to the Jewish schooling world, not just to Jewish day schools, but to any Jewish school, back in 1970 in a wonderful book that uh, David Sidorsky um, uh, edited about the future of the Jewish community. And he said basically, where is the supreme value of Torah Lishma? Learning for its own sake. And Deborah focused on this in her remarks in talking about having people be scholars and lifelong learners. Forget about the idea about whether school is supposed to overturn the society and create a Jewish renaissance or whether it's just a gateway into uh, higher education and we're just running a bunch of fancy Jewish prep schools. What about the joy of learning? What about the idea of chavruta, people studying in a peer-mediated kind of instruction? What about the here and now? What about the value of lifelong learning? What about cultivating this kind of learning, not only for our students, but for their teachers, for their parents, for their grandparents, for the entire community? Third point, breaking down the silos. Those of you who uh, follow the publications of the Avichai Foundation probably know Jack Wertheimer's piece on breaking down the silos. I think a very important contribution, at least in North America, but I think it applies to Jewish day schools anywhere around the world. And that is really the question of how broadly does the Jewish day school see its role and its reach? Is it operating in silo-like fashion and minding its own business? Or is it linked and connected to the rest of the Jewish community? And I would challenge all of us here that day schools cannot, must not, and should not be isolated islands. There are bridges to build with synagogues, bridges to build with JCCs, bridges to build with federations, bridges to build with early childhood centers and making sure that some of the fear that Deborah expressed to us about what might happen in early childhood centers as, as they become more and more academic, that we can sort of stem that a little bit, but also build a relationship literally from birth on up through the high school years. That day schools need to be rooted in the broader community and need to be seen as a valuable and integral communal asset not only for its current users, but for the community as a whole. And there are even day schools. One I'm thinking of in particular in San Diego, California, happens to be a modern Orthodox school that actually reaches out beyond the Jewish community with many of its programs because it believes that it is also a communal resource. It's an institution of learning that the entire general community can benefit from. Fourth point, which comes in Deborah's book, um, Power of Their Ideas, she talks about education as a shared responsibility. And she mentioned in her remarks about teachers discoursing together and taking collective responsibility for what's happening with the young in their school. But it applies to Jewish day schools as well. Jewish day schools as a shared responsibility. It's not just the responsibility of the users. It's valued as an essential Jewish communal asset. We have to make day schools more integral and organically connected to the fabric of Jewish community. And I'm thrilled that uh, Jay Lieberman of the Perlman School is here because just three short weeks ago and a couple of days on top of that, there was a wonderful dinner that took place that raised a lot of money for a school. But the theme of the dinner that was carefully constructed and was a message that was given to a lot of people sitting in the room who were not so close to the school, which was celebrating its 50th anniversary, the message was shared responsibility. And we need many schools that are saying that the Jewish community needs these schools. It's not just about who's in the four walls right now. It's that these schools are organic institutions to the community, and they are part of the landscape of a literate, vibrant Jewish future. Finally, in conclusion, I want to let Deborah conclude. And in her book, Power of Their Ideas, page 184, if you want to check on it, because it's a great quote, I quote her from the book, what makes me hopeful, no matter what bad news tomorrow brings, is our infinite capacity for inventing the future, imagining things otherwise.
End quote. It's a great idea. It's a great belief. It's the essence of vision. And this is Deborah's challenge to each of us to envision and to dream. The rich possibilities of interplay between day schools and the communities which surround them beckon to each of us. Let us seize the moment. Thank you. Thank you, Josh, for those inspiring words. Uh, uh, last, but by no means least, uh, we turn now to Professor Michael Rosenack, Emeritus Professor of Jewish Education at the Melton Center of the Hebrew University, but someone who really needs no introduction in this place and for this audience. I imagine that I speak for a great many others in this room when I speak of Mike having been for me a master teacher, a mentor, and a mensch. In turning to Mike to act as a respondent this evening, we not only sought to recreate the arrangement of books on my bookshelf at home, where Deborah's books sit snugly alongside Mike's, we also wanted to turn to somebody whose capacity for analysis and interpretation would help draw out the challenges and opportunities in Deborah's remarks for the community of Jewish educators. One could not wish for a more accomplished Mored Derech, a guide into the world of educational ideas. Professor Rosenack. Uh, <clears throat> it's, it's somewhat difficult uh, to know uh, how to uh, frame a response. Because the response, of course, has to deal directly with what one is responding to, which means that you have to be thinking on your feet or rather in your chair and uh, preparing to uh, finding some way to organize this wealth of material uh, presented so lucidly that we have been privileged to be at this evening. About three minutes ago, uh, I hit upon a uh, conceptual scheme, which I think may be useful to us <laughs> in analyzing or in understanding and furthering uh, some of the important ideas that we've heard. I referred to a teaching of one of my teachers here at the School of Education, uh, Professor Ernst Akiva Simon of Blessed Memory, who was a philosopher of education <clears throat> and who lived by his teachings. Uh, in one of his uh, autobiographical writings, he tells the story of a scholar, a German scholar, asking him whether he would enter the academic communi community and profession. All he had to do was, a few, with, a few, with a few drops of water, baptism, uh, he would be able to qualify uh, for academic life. Whereupon he said, sir, I have decided not to be a German scholar, but a Jewish teacher in Eretz Israel. Uh, and that, that is what he lives by. Now, the conception that I want to bring to your attention is what he calls Tmimut Shnia, the second innocence. And the second innocence, which is the aim of good education, is based on a, a dialectic process wherein one is first uh, in a situation of first innocence, Tom Rishon, meaning stupid. Uh, not understanding the world, not even being able to communicate except by crying or whining or what have you, or saying uh, simple childish things which sometimes are not properly fielded by adults the way Debbie has taught us that they should be. The first innocence uh, is uh, the first stage. And it is followed by a second stage, which is the loss of innocence. In the loss of innocence, we pile up good grades in school, social skills, 
uh, all kinds of things that make us feel that we are with it. But the personal, if you will, if you will, the play element has gone out of it. And the person who has gone through this disillusionment, uh, who has become a lapsed first innocent, uh, that person really has no friends, has no real intellectual desires that are not related to some uh, wish to achieve a certain status. And that person uh, is considered to be smart, but is not really wise. And then, says Simon, there is the possibility that there will be a third innocence, second innocence. The second innocence is a state where suddenly you see the complexity of things, you develop a sense of irony, but you also develop a sense of what is really important, what points to the transcendental, what makes it possible for people to grow, whether they are doing a particular kind of learning at the moment or not, that makes it possible to see that, for them to see that all situations are complex. That, to give an example from our, from our own discussions during these days, as I imagine them, Jewish education is not only texts. And Jewish education without texts is not really Jewish education. And where there's no room for arts and crafts, scholarly endeavors will be distorted in the way that they shape the person personality of the learner. Uh, Deborah says this very nicely in uh, her description, description of what democracy is. Actually, the whole discussion that we've had here and the paper that we've heard has to do with the shaping of a democratic personality. And democracy, I would say, turns out to be a language for education and an outcome of it, not merely a means of, or not merely content. You live within it. It's not something that you meet on the street and look at face to face, but rather you are it and you are in it and it involves all kinds of challenges. Now the main, one of the main challenges that I find articulated by Deborah is the challenge of community. You can't have democracy without community, the way you can't have Judaism without community. But the community in recent generations has receded. It has receded for various reasons, one which Deborah, I think, did not mention tonight. She talked about habit and the importance of habit, even in difficult times. But the question of norms, I don't recall whether she mentioned. Norms used to create and hold together communities, and now they don't. And we can't have democracy, and we can't have healthy schools, and we can't really have education. We can have teaching, but we can't have education without them. Now, a very profound idea that never derives from this situation is that even though she doesn't put it exactly this way, if you can't have the normative community, at least let's have the exemplary individuals with whom children should be brought together so that the, that the community and its norms can be re rebuilt on the basis of personal reliability, on the basis of, of love, on the basis of admiration for people who have standards, uh, on the basis of intergenerational encounters. This is uh, actually uh, what she is describing here might actually suffer from what I'm doing at this moment because it is, it's not good to analyze it. It's good to do it. Uh, it, it. It draws us back to the idea which all 
people who have studied analytical philosophy of education know from the first lesson, you can't, you teach mathematics, but you educate people. You can't educate mathematics, even though a mathematics teacher may be a great educator. It depends how he is in class. Thus it turns out that we are faced with a whole number of dialectical situations, paradoxes, ironies, it, which we must learn, in which we must be educated, but at the same time, they have to lead us to a second innocence, and this second innocence, which is intelligent and sophisticated, is what he calls, I think, trust and empathy. The empathy for other people is not based on your not knowing what they're really like. And it's also not based on your not knowing what the world is really like. It's based on knowing, but still. That's, that's why it's called innocence. I think this is the kind of innocence that Deborah is talking about. And I will not now rehearse all of the various uh, contradistinctions that he made and that uh, Josh made. The night is not that young. Uh, but I would like to, uh, uh, and I would like to reinforce uh, first of so, uh, what uh, Josh has said about the proximity of many of the, the ideals and conceptions for Jewish education that uh, uh, come to us from general education or that share a common background. And it's a, good, it's a good thing that we had Howie to uh, tell us about the first minister of, of education, but one can understand that also in a different way. And I don't know which is closer to Deborah's meaning, and that is that the establishment of these schools was an achievement, but it was also a sad achievement, because it meant that parents were no longer teaching their children. And therefore they were not uh, able, they were, were, not, were not able to sit at the table of Deborah's parents who had a, a rhetoric of Jewishness that w w expected itself to be copied and to be transmitted to the next generation. And the problem that the Talmud is relating to, if I'm not mistaken, is that there are severe consequences when that chain is broken and one of, the, one of the consequences is that you need education. <coughs> but I, I, say I, won't, I don't want to go through that uh, whole list. What I do want to do, very briefly, um, building perhaps on, um, well, I won't build on the concept here of habit. I think we've rehearsed that as well. What I want to talk about for a moment, in conclusion, uh, is uh, the whole question of the day school in the democratic society. The democratic society as being not what some people in, also in Israel think democracy is, that once in four years you go to vote, but rather democracy as a way of life, a worldview, a process consciously undertaken, uh, a respect born not only of love, but also of habit. What is the relationship of this school that we're talking about to that society? And I, because the problem is here. When somebody speaks in Julian or Deborah's terms of democracy, they are speaking of a faith. They are speaking of a comprehensive view of the world, comprehensive obligations, convictions, commitments. So that a person can say, I am a, I am a, I try to be a democratic person is like saying I try to be a pious person. In, in a different context. Pious. pious. Now, this, imagine for a moment what this means for an institution of Jewish learning for children called the day school to which parents send their children, or at least educators like Josh know that they ought to be there for one reason, and that is to develop a comprehensive view. 
Not Hebrew school, because Hebrew school is something alongside your civilization. But the day school is supposed to bring people into the world of Jewish existence, which is very similar in scope to what is being what is done in a democracy or by Democrats. Now, Josh mentioned that but softened it. Because he said you have democracy, well we have democracy. Or we have this is true, but the comprehensiveness of the ideal cannot but lead to the need for this, the kind of discussion that will lead to a second innocence. In other words, if we're going to be really deeply committed to democracy and to Judaism, and therefore to devote ourselves and invest heavily in Jewish schools where the whole day is Jewish and where all of the things that Deborah mentioned about the family are desired, how do you do this? And one of the people who was most uh, influential as a thinker about this subject was a philosopher sociologist who wrote his most important book in the 1930s, Judaism as a Civilization, the man was Mordechai Kaplan. Mordechai Kaplan, a disciple of Dewey, uh, a man of cognitive deliberation, uh, claimed that Jews must live both in the American civilization or whichever civilization they live in and in the Jewish civilization. I don't want to go now into the question of what distinctions he drew and, and what differences he found. But he made a comment, I think in response to a question, and that is that outside of the land of Israel, the, the dominant civilization in the life of a Jew should be the dominant civilization of that place. He said, I'm a Zionist, and therefore I want Eretz Israel to be the place where we can also have the Jewish civilization as being the dominant one. Let's say. One day, a student of mine turned to Mordechai Kaplan. Kaplan was living in Jerusalem at the time, at the age of 90, I think. And uh, my student, uh, who had been studying at the university, who was just becoming very interested in Judaism, called Mordechai Kaplan and said, will you study Torah with me? Kaplan didn't know him from Adam. He had never met Kaplan. But Kaplan immediately said, I'll be happy to study with you on two conditions. One, we study every day. I have no time for uh, frills. If we want to study Torah, we're going to study it seriously, every day. Kaplan incidentally was a wonderful teacher of Torah. Two, you're go you, ha you have to start wearing tzitzit. My student was flabbergasted. Why should he wear tzitzit? He said to Kaplan, well, I understand about every day, but why tzitzit? Kaplan said, you know, I've always taught and have always believed that we Jews must live in two civilizations. But I, I underestimated the strength of the other one. And therefore, anything that expresses the Jewish civilization, I'm in favor of. You don't have to become a fundamentalist in order to do it. God forbid. Uh, you just have to do it. Now this opens up a whole Pandora's box of problems, questions, of the relationship between universalism and particularism, and one question in particular, and with this I will end. Unlike the public school in America, which also has problems of survival in the sense that its ethos is threatened by the lack of community and by all the things that you have mentioned, the Jewish school has this even worse. 
Because Jews, especially after the Holocaust, in the age of post-enlightenment, of post-modernism, or what have you, the Jews are a threatened species. The need to survive in a society which you love, which you cherish, whose values you agree with, creates a problem. Marshall Sklar, the sociologist, wrote in 1962 in an essay in Commentary magazine called Intermarriage in the Jewish Future. He said there, he said there that all of the statistics that we have in intermarriage, that we have, meaning 1962, are false. They are misleading. They include couples who got married in 1902. They don't tell you what's going on today. And we are facing a situation that within 50 years we will no longer exist here. What's the solution? It's a very painful solution or maybe painful way of saving the problem. He said Jews have to be proud Americans. They have to love the democracy in America. They are part of the, they contribute to it. They also have to give a message in their education of somehow not being of it, of being different. And this has to be done without injury to the noble, ethical, democratic ideas in which we believe but we believe as a member of a somehow different group. Now, I don't know whether a lot of American educators would not consider that to be unacceptable. And the reason is, of course, because just as the Jewish ideal is a universal and comprehensive one, be Jewish and everything, so is that American democratic ideal. And the question is how to put them together so that Humpty Dumpty won't fall down. Thank you. Okay, I promised those who are, who are football fanatics, soccer fanatics, that they would be in home in, home in time for kickoff, and I think uh, we've done that well. But before allowing you to leave. I think, um, uh, I think our three presenters this evening have not only left us with inspiring ideas, they've left us with challenging questions. And I can't think of a better way of starting a conference. Uh, better to start with questions. Uh, and in fact, ideal even better to, to finish with even more questions than you started. And together, we've really seen the possibilities of dialogue between public and Jewish education, the inspiration that public education can offer to Jewish educators when it is translated in the skilled, through the skilled hands of experienced and thoughtful individuals. So can I thank the three of you for working so well together, I have to say. Thank you very much indeed. I will tell you only on a technical note that we will reconvene tomorrow at 9 a.m. with Ellen Goldring, but we won't be in this room. I think we will be on the f in room 502. We will be on the fifth floor on room 502, and the conference will continue then. Thank you, and Laila Tov.